people are not, you can't work in TV houses. Your production time is 6 o'clock. Production time, you are still working around. Yeah, you are the, all this, all this one you are asking me. You can see that I'm asking you with a scattered brain because I, I wasn't quite. Hallelujah. Let's begin to appreciate the name of the Lord for he is good, for his mercies endures forever. Let's appreciate God who has been gracious to us, who has been good to us, who has been to worship your God Almighty. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for, your, for all good things. That you have done for us, for which, Lord, we are glad, for which we are eternally grateful. Thank you, Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we'll lift up holy hands in one accord singing blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be the name of the lord is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord, singing, Blessed be your name, hallelujah. Blessed be your name, hallelujah. Blessed be your name, O Lord. Worthy, you are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Worthy. You are 
our graciousness, for your mercy, for your faithfulness in our lives, in our family, in our work, in our health, in all that pertains unto us. Lord, accept our worship and our thanksgiving in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we gather together this evening, we open our hearts to you, Lord, that as we learn by your Spirit, one from another, Father, we pray that, Lord, you breathe upon your word. Let your word become life and spirit unto us. Help us, O oh God, that, Lord, we will leave this place better than we came. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We pray for those who are here to come, those who are meant to be here. Lord, we ask the Lord will bring them here safely in the name of Jesus. Remove every impediment from their way, every indecision. Father, we pray by your spirit, you persuade them to be here. Together, Lord, we'll be blessed because we came. For those that will join us online, Father, we pray for them as well, that our fellowship indeed will be with one another and with you there, Lord. Thank you, Father, for hearing us as we start in your name. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hallelujah. Please, let's have our seat. You're welcome in the name of Jesus. Okay. Um, for those of us who are conversant, and for those who might not be, the theme for this parish for this year, 2024, is the year of total restoration. And our Bible study on the beginning of the year has been focused on total restoration. However, for the ease of our studies, we have subdivided the theme for the year into sub-themes. And our first quarter of Bible study series started sometime in January, January 12th to be precise, and today marks the end of a quarter study. And the sub theme for this quarter has been the ingredients of restoration. Ingredients of restoration. So we have taken different Bible study topics uh, in the course of the year from January 12th to today being January and February March, sorry, March 22nd. So we have taken a series of studies. But today what we are doing today is that we are doing a general uh, review of what we have done. So we're going to have times for comments, for studies that we're able to attend, maybe questions we could not entertain or discussions that we could not take on. We'll try and make it as brief but as straightforward as we can so that we can cover as many. So that is what this is about, is for us to just go through what we have done and see how well, um, if there are comments or questions or further enlightenment, if there is any. Maybe going forward in the next quarter, one of the things we will try and do is to remind ourselves to please come with our outline when we have the end of the quarter so that the person will be moderating will not be the only one that is armed with all the study outlines that we have taken. But for today, that is the way it's going to be. So for the first quarter, for, for this quarter, our first Bible study topic was total restoration. Um, total restoration was well, I've been taken by the vicar. I think it was taken by uh, Canon Emmanuel Chibuze was total restoration. That was what uh, we had then. And um, I don't know whether there was anybody who attended that study, but for the purpose of our conversation, let's quickly open our Bibles to Joy chapter 2. Joy chapter 2. Our text here says from 18 to 27. George chapter 2 from verse 18. 
to 27. Then would the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove fire from you, the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea, and his inner part towards the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill silver shall come up, because he had, shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust had eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, so um, if we followed that reading, particularly verse 25, Joel 2 25 says, And I restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten the canker worms and the caterpillar which I sent unto you. Maybe for the purpose of refreshing um, ourselves, what did we say total restoration is? When we talk about total restoration, from our study, what exactly did we discuss with particular reference to Joel Chapter 2, verse 25. Can somebody just remind us? Both from the dictionary and from that, whatever. Is there any contribution? Remember, we have how many outlines we have to go? We have like uh, seven. six or seven outlines, so we're still with the first one. So, what exactly do we mean by total restoration? Yeah, please, who has a mic? Since the vicar did not take us, I, he was <laughs> represented, so he can answer the... No, I think I took that study myself. Did you? I did, I did. Uh, okay. I took that study myself. So um, it's about returning something to its former state. And I think we even went on further to say, to say that it could even be better than what it was formerly, taking something back to its original state or even... And that is exactly what Joel 2.25 was talking about. I restore to you the years... That has been eaten. I'm going to bring back those years that have been eaten up. So, somebody help us with Job 42. There are not too many physically present here right now. So, it should not be difficult to have somebody read. Um, so, is that Ereolua that is in front of Ereolua? Can you please read Job 42 for us? And verse 10 to 12. Then after Job had prayed for his three friends, the Lord made him prosperous again, and he gave him twice as much as he had, he had had before. All Job's brothers and sisters and former friends came to visit him and feasted with him in his house. They expressed their sympathy and comforted him for all the troubles the Lord had brought on him. Each of them gave him some money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the last part of Job's life, even more than he had blessed the Job. Job owned 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 2,000 head of cattle, and 1,000 donkeys. All right. So, 
What does it say to us about total restoration from that outline? What exactly did we bring up? Which has been, somehow the vicar had alluded to it when he was explaining. So what can we say here? Using the Job example, we do this out of the study. Yes. Hello, I do want to from what you read. What happened to Job? He was blessed. Yes. Was he just blessed? What did he say about the blessing? I think there was something that was said about that blessing that Job received. That it was twice better than what he had before. So what he lost before, God restored it and made it twice better than it. And his latter end was better than his beginning. So that beginning, if you say that was good, God is making you say that. If I does a child's play, there's something far better than good. And there's something far better than better. God best. Hallelujah. Okay, so do we have any general comments on that? Study? Question. Okay. The question is to the house so that we can move to the next outline. I breathe in, I breathe out. <laughs> My question is very, very deep. Okay. And thank God I have color men around me. <laughs> what is total restoration? I ask in the context of when we talk about restoration from the perspective of, what's that? Okay. When we talk about the restoration in, from the perspective of um, material restoration, it might be when I say material restoration now, okay, gentlemen. When we talk about restoration in terms of material restoration, maybe it's easier to right. talk about, you know, an increase, or you could talk about greater twice and all that. But just Job when it comes to intangible, is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. Job lost his children. He got new children, but the ones he lost, he had lost them. How do we how do we look at that? I don't know whether my question makes. You, the, you have said it. You eh? have, yes, sir. You have said you are surrounded by, <laughs> by clergymen. No, they. But, they, but, but, but my, does my, have I been able to communicate my question? What you are saying, what it appears that you are saying, and I hope um, I'm getting that right. What you appear to be saying is okay, what was lost was lost, as in those who were dead, for example. It's not as if they resurrected. All right, they were just brand new children. Yes. Let so me, let me help him. I think the, the Bible even tried to qualify it. First, um, I think lost um, of a child is a very deep thing. Um, yes, because if we look at um, first the way the way they now we now describe the children of Job, the daughters. In fact, if you, in that, um, the later part of that chapter, that uh, the children that God gave him were really just, were extremely beautiful. They, they tried to qualify it, to say they, they, are, they are better. You know, um, yesterday we were at um, a birthday of a, a woman that was a clocked 100. You know, she was agile, strong, dancing. She read in the service. You know, but 
Just like I was saying, I remember that too, she lost two of her children. But you see, those things really still didn't take away the joy of that day. It didn't take away the, the joy of that day. So sometimes, it's not something that we pray for, but you know, uh, the Bible will talk about Kenya, there are Konda or more that a one child can be better than, um, the, 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 than a thousand. And if God blesses you with that one, even though a lot has happened before, like child labor, you just, when those joy, those joyous times come, you will forget the sorrow. All right, thank you very much. I think that's part of the place that Vika was alluding to. Also, I think I found that here. And he says that, and in verse 15, and in all the land there were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. So, um, they were beautiful children, and there was no doubt it was a recompense for whatever was the loss of the past. Okay, can we move to the next uh, outline? Break up your fallow ground. Um, so somebody should please read Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 for us. That was a text. That was a text. 12. Microphone please. Yes, Isaiah 10, 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Okay. That is the text that we use. Maybe I should avail us. Let me quickly read uh, part of the introduction here. Just to remind for those who are here and those who are not here. Part of the introduction here says, Fallow grounds or lands are pieces of land that have been abandoned or left unattended to for various reasons. In places where land is surplus, farmers practice what is called shifting cultivation. This is a method of agriculture involving temporary cultivation of a piece of land which is subsequently abandoned for a period, enabling the natural growth of animals, weeds, debris, and wild fruit before it is eventually reclaimed for farming. When the farmer returns to use the abandoned land, he must clear the bushes, cultivate it, and get it ready for planting. That is, it has come to break the fallow ground. Now, a bit of agriculture was introduced in this introduction. And I remember that I did a bit of agri too. And shifting cultivation became a slang when I was also in school. So shifting cultivation, a moment where a land that is used for agricultural purpose is left for a period and is not used. And you allow grasses and all things to grow and the place to look like a wasteland you have shifted to another land where you are cultivating. And then after a while, you go back there, clear the place, and reclaim the land for agricultural uses. So that the land goes to a natural process of, you know, of renewal before you start farming on it again. Now, it says to us, that is breaking your fallow ground. When you leave the land like that, it becomes fallow. It becomes unused. And when you want to go back there, you go and break it. Whether you are using a tractor you are using a hoe. You are trying to get the soil back to agricultural usage, back to life. So, now, in Isaiah 10, 12, he's saying to us, break up your fallow ground. So it means that somehow, we are like that land, that piece of land that was left unattended to, where wild animals, deaths, everything, has been on, and then it is time for us to come back and be of use 
you know, to God. So how can we break our fallow grounds? From us here, using that, that illustration, how do you think you and I can break our fallow ground? Where is the ground? Maybe we should start from there. Learn the study. In our own case, where is the ground that we want to break? Anybody wants to answer that? When, when as, as, as you are reading and you are talking about um, follow ground, you know, the way it is kind of coming to me, or that is, that I'm thinking about it is that, you know, when you ask that question, generally, where's your follow ground? Typically, maybe what I will answer is your heart is the ground that needs to be broken and all that. But as you ask that question, what was coming to my mind is that for all of us as individuals, there are areas of our life that can be said to be fallow at given points in time. Relating a bit with the story or the, the um, ag agricultural um, situation that you talked about. A, a farmland that maybe deliberately was left uncultivated. Now, in our case, it might not be a deliberate living, but it could just be an area of our life that for some reason or the other, we have not paid enough attention. And so, that area of our lives become a fallow ground. And from time to time, as we study the word of God as we build ourselves the spirit of God brings to our attention the need to deal and to you know to work on those areas of our lives so that we can become better believers or we can we can like one of the scriptures that you know, I, I, I keep talking about and I, it's very strong in my spirit now is when the scripture says, grow in grace. Grow in grace. It's telling you about the need that there's, 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 oh, there was something that I read recently and let me, let me just share, talk about that and stop. You know, it was talking about the fact that the, the, you, you still, you are, you are the one that will accept to step down, even when you are right. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and trying to break it down uh, in, in very simple, uh, to, for us to identify with. But he was talking about in situations, <laughs> anyway, let me say, it. you know, even at home, in, in, in our marriages, you have a situation whereby your wife has done things that you are, you are really boiling and you are upset. And yet the Spirit of God is saying you are the one to step down. Yeah. But with the dimension in which um, he also came in with a comment this evening. So I'm also now seeing it as, it's not as even we say a fallow ground or in the life of a Christian. Now we're not talking about the land, but our life and all of that. It doesn't just totally speak to the fact that maybe one is off track or one is outside the confine of the Father's will. But rather, you know, in the process of becoming, the Bible says, as we behold him, we are being conformed from glory to glory. So maybe more like it's a gradual process for us in that part of becoming more like him. And so that means I don't just suddenly become. It's a step by step one. For the conscious effort, like he said, you're by the place of the study of the world, gathering of the brethren, and you keep getting better at what you are or what you do in all facets of life. That is what makes the difference. So it now comes down to the fact that it's not just about the fact that I'm outside the Father's fold, 
Yes, I might even be in him. But all of the lifestyle I brought from where I'm coming from before I became a part of the body of Christ, I also need to now begin to shed them off. So the process of me shedding them off, okay, maybe I, brought, I came with 20 baggages. I have dropped away maybe about 14 out of the 20. The remaining six are still those grounds that I also need to break off from so that I can now be said to be fully aligned with what the Father intends to achieve with my life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, last speaker. Let me just also reiterate part of what we said at that study. We had to look at the parable of the sower yeah. in, that, in that study. Um, and we talked about the, the seed that fell on the road, on the wayside, where directly we are just referring to our lives, basically, and how somehow, because of the fallow ground, the seed did not grow. And I also think we can also um, align with what um, Bromwe once said, that in our lives we can look at those areas in our lives that we have not bear fruit as we ought to. And one, it could it be in that fallow ground, for some of the things we said and I remembered, you know, that seed they said is a work part. Though you have planted the seed, just in the study, is brokenness. And um, that also has to do whether in every situation, and I like the fact that the parable was alluded to, which was also done during the study. That all of these things also centers around the heart issue. And when God is able to break through those areas of our lives, it draws our attention to need for us to let go, you know, and allow God to do his work in us. Hallelujah. Let's look at the other uh, Bible study discussion we have. Please, in the course of this conversation, if there's any of the Bible studies that you attended and you think that there were some things that, question that you wanted to ask, please, this is meant to trigger it off while we're keeping our eyes on the time. Now we're looking at power of unity. We dealt with power of unity. And um, I will just ask somebody to read Genesis 11 from verse 2 to 6. Just as a way of reminder, um, Genesis 11, verse 2 to 6, one of the texts, we are two of them. Let's read Genesis 11. Please, can we have that quickly? Genesis 11, verse 2 to 6. And it says, Speak to the mic, please. Genesis 11, verse 2 to 6, and it says, As they wandered about in the east, they came to a plain in Babylonia and said to there, they said to one another, Come on, let's make bricks and bake them hard. So they had bricks to build with and tar to hold them together. They said, Now let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky, so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which those men had built. And he said, Now then, these are, these are all one people and they speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they are going to do. Soon they will be, soon they will be able to do anything they want. Okay. Thank you for that. Let me read a a part of the introduction to us um, so that we can be refreshed and for those who are not here. It says, unity is not merely the absence of conflict, but the active coming together of individuals, communities, or nations for a common purpose or goal. Now, in this passage we have read, we can see how the people came together for a purpose, for a goal. And they, they were clear what they wanted to achieve, and they came together towards that. And I, part of my introduction says, yes, there may be conflict, but there's a deliberate, or let me use the language that is common today, an intentional coming together for a common purpose, for a common intention, to achieve something. Together. That is what we're looking at when we're talking about the power of unity. 
So, let me ask us, how can we come together even in the presence or when there is clear existence of conflict or dissent or disagreement? When there is a shade of opinion that is not, that you are not, you know, you are not seeing together, but yet you need to be united. You need to work together. How is that? How is that a possibility? That is the question that we have for ourselves as a follow-up from this study um, that we had the other time. And then, of course, we will take a quick look before we round up with the implications of this unity. But let's look at this issue of unity. How do you, how can, I have, I have a namesake here, Tunde. How can you and I agree when we, already, when, we are disag when we are already disagreeing and we don't seem to, to find a basis to agree and yet we are supposed to be, to be united, we are supposed to work in unity for a common goal. For a common purpose. What do you think? I'm not putting you on the spot. Webinizer will speak next. Um, I know Webinizer. You were the study, Webinizer. Power of unity. You were there. Okay. For the purpose of the of the unity, I mean, maybe the project or what we want to achieve. It depends of what we want to do. If what we want to do, Mr. Hayes had the part of it, Mr. C had the part of it. Were you not there? No. Hey, I thought you, there was a day you were and talking then, about a project that you were doing with somebody. Now you are talking, I'm trying to remember. Okay. Now, maybe uh, Mr. Let's say about five people have different parts to make that tax to come to. There's no way you can say that because we have a disagreement and we know that this tax is for us to do. We just have to come to agreement for the sake of that, what we want to achieve. Then we have to work together to achieve it. I think that's what I mean. Okay. Okay. I like that. But I've been either. Um, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so coming from the aspect of unity, you know, and the scripture from within you. So do you remember from within you? So do you remember that incident and then you are all together mad as you were the day it happened? Or you remember it and you're smiling, it's like, mm, thank God. And then you are willing to still extend the hand of fellowship or care to the person. So talking about the power of unity here and what it also points out, like you said, is the fact that even in the midst of all of the challenges that might have um, occurred or that might have happened. We see beyond the issues. We see beyond the opposing views. We see beyond the diverse opinions to achieve a particular goal. Because at the end of the thing, you realize that what happens most times is the fact that we are all going the same way, but the route we intend to take is what is different. And so if my own reality is to go through the back and you are going through the front. You said something earlier on that. You know, I was talking about even said something earlier on that. You know, I was talking about even the people that are married and there are times that you are boiling because maybe madam has done something for you. But you just have to still take the place of, um, okay, let me calm down and still apologize even when you are not at fault. And that's because I'm sure the person that concept is focused on ensuring that even though I know this is my right, but there is a focus, there is a goal, which is the fact that at the end of the day, this family is united. We are one. So when we also bring that pers pers perspective to our daily living and our dealings even with one another, yes, I might be hurt, I might be offended, but the goal is that we achieve this result. And knowing that this person too is a human and we are still work in progress, maybe that makes it much more tenable for us to accommodate their excesses while subtly letting them know that, oh, but you know that this thing you did, it came off this way to me. But you know, there's a way you also say it that shows that you're interested in showing love or settling it, not coming off like, oh, he's fight for all and will go all the way. I was having a training this afternoon at work and it has to do with communication. 
And you know the person said, even when the client is telling you and you know keeps making you get angry and all, how do you react? And the, one of the comments was the fact that there's a way you'd even respond to emails that a person, no matter how angry the person might be, just realize that, ah, I think I'm the one that is not being reasonable at this point. So in all of these, yes, those concerns will come, the discords and reasons that will make us want to have issues will arise. But how we now treat it, how we pick it up with our focus on the end result, which is to achieve that particular goal, helps us so much to be able to deal with it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, um, I'm not going to allow too much talk here, uh, but can somebody tell us what's the implication of this unity? Our brother has been talking about keeping the goal, keeping the objective in focus. Um, yes, you may have a shades of opinion and all of that, but we know that this is what we want to achieve. Now, Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they agree? And in Matthew 18, 19, he was talking about praying. He said, if two of you shall agree concerning anything. So there is, the power of unity is so strong that once there is an agreement to do something, it is doable. Once there is an agreement to do something, it is doable. So it, unity is very important. So what then, the reverse flip side, this unity, what's the implication? One, just one. Somebody, Irelua and um, don't let me call you the name. We're online. Both of you will answer my question. So give me one example of the implication of this unity. When people are not united, one of the, one of the fallout. Let's start with a man. Well, since you are staring at me. So when there's this unity, because you are not paying full attention, when there's this unity, what happens? Give me an example, an example. Ma'am. When there is this unity, we tend to be selfish. I can hear you. Example, all right. For instance. If I can't hear you, I'm sure people online can't hear you. When there is implications this, of disunity. When when there is um, disunity, we intend to be selfish. We tend to be selfish. Yes. Okay. Next person. Tend to be selfish. I just want to hear something. I didn't say whether you're right or wrong, go. Really well. When there's disunity, what happens? You should know now. Uh, when there's disunity, you know, there is no progress. Thank you. There's no progress. There's no progress. Okay. Uh, give uh, Tunde. I can see the drama is in the house. I'm greeting you. When there is disunity, there will be a discomfort. There will be discomfort? Yes. Okay. Can you help me give Venable in front of you? I need to hear Venable like Baboye's voice. When is this unity, sir? Can you give us just one of the fallout? Well, he, he, he talked about um, lack of progress. I, 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 guess, I guess there are times we ought to be concerned what was the motive for initiating a project in the first place. Uh -huh. These people decided to come together to make a name for themselves, yeah. to establish a city and build a tower in it. But God was, not, God was not pleased with their action and he decided to scatter or confuse their language. So at times when a project is initiated, for instance, did you consult God? Uh, what, what was the motive behind it? Is it self-glory? Uh, so, so at times we may not make good success if God is, is not in it. So, and then God has his ways of, of truncating uh, whatever steps we may have taken. So I'm looking at it from, from various Side perspectives. So then on the other hand, when, when there seems to be progress, is this really progress? Uh -huh. Because there can be movement. There can be movement. Motion. But, uh -huh. Motion but there's no movement. There's, 
Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you, sir. It's a good one. It's actually, like we said, it's just we're doing a summary, part of what we attended to in the question two of the actual outline. What you said, sir, was taken care of at the study. Okay. Um, but I'm aware, even though I would have loved to end this, but I asked, no, but I'm aware we talk, and Evika will be the last. Okay, you should say something now. Implication of this unity. You want, you also need to tell me, sir. Let me just end. Sorry, sir. Do you, do you want to say something? You don't want to? Okay. Let's conclude on that. If, I know one of the things that we mentioned that um, the blessing, the text we are looking at um, is a function that is the theme, total restoration um, from the book of Joel. Find out that God was pronouncing a prophetic blessing upon them. And I know in this study we had to look at how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. We made reference to it here. And one of the things we talk about is that the blessing flows from the head, from the air down the beard to, down to his skirt. So when there is this unity, you see, the blessing does not flow down and it's, it's very, very Im important when we are together as a family that the blessings of God will flow, particularly when we are talking about this blessing of God's total restoration. Okay, can we move on to the next study, which our brother was trying to allude to? We talked about forgiveness, this study. And I need somebody to quickly read Matthew 6, 15, which was a text, the subject of forgiveness. What exactly does it mean to forgive? Can somebody quickly read that passage for us and probably tell us what exactly does it mean to forgive? Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So what, can you explain forgiveness? And then I'll wait for somebody else to help us tell us the implication of. Yes, please. Okay, so basically, um, forgiveness, right? Or not forgiveness. forgiveness. Okay, so speaking about forgiveness, it's basically um, letting go of the art, the anger, and whatever that comes or even in our day-to-day -day living, and knowing that this so-called art can interfere with our relationship with God. So when you know this thing is capable of holding me down in my own relationship and work with God, you know it's something that you're already holding on as art or against someone else. And despite knowing that, oh, this thing pains me, I feel the art, I feel bad about it and all of that, but you know letting go of it, and in other words, they will say like living vengeance to him who owns it and not for you. So I think that's basically what forgiveness means, letting go, even when it hurts. Okay. Um, we have, I know there's somebody else in the house, so I'm not going to ignore there's a beautiful sister in the house. Sorry, ma. You're part of the study, so maybe I should ask you, what do you think forgiveness is? Or what does it, can you explain what you think about forgiveness. We treated it as a study. We're just reviewing. Now you read, you had us read Matthew 6.15. So what do you think? Very quickly. Um, forgiveness is just like um, allowing a person, someone that hurts you. I can't, I can't hear you well. And people are watching you online. They are listening. Allowing someone that hurts you to like, like letting go of hurts that was given by someone in order for you to have peace of mind. Because if you don't forgive someone, you can't have peace of mind. Okay. Our outline, thank you. Our outline even says, forgiveness is deliberate decision to let go the bitterness, resentment, anger towards oneself or another as a result of real or perceived sin or offense. Another one says, releasing the guilty from the burden of their sins. 
You know, this person, yes, he has done something wrong, but I let you go. Something like that. So, now. Unforgiveness, it, 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 it costs you. Even though you are in the good mood and that person shows up, oh, so it's not good for our health. Then when, Jesus, when people have Jesus, if someone, someone sin against you, how many times do you should okay, we forgive? And Jesus said, thousands of times, 7,000 times, something. 7,000. So it really hinders blessing as, as they said. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, so um, because of time, remember we also talked about forgive and forgetting. I think that's where Brother Benizia was talking about. And we talked about forgiving and forgetting. And I would also like to say as my own contribution that um, it was a very interesting canon is present here. We remember that we had that conversation around forgiving and forgetting. And uh, I remember the, the vicar citing a very, a very powerful, you know, um, yeah, very powerful for me because I did not forget it. It registered. And using the story of Joseph uh, to bring home, I remember the canon telling me that there's nowhere in the Bible or telling us, but I took it as also to me, that there's nowhere in the Bible where you see forgive and forget. Uh, you see forgive. And the, the vicar was citing an example of Joseph who remembered what his brethren did to him. But rather than feeling offended, you know, said, look, you guys meant it for, for evil, but God has turned it around for good. He didn't feel an iota of bitterness towards them. Yes, it was painful. He went to a corner, he wept and all of that. But, you know, the, the act was not for is one of the big lessons. If there was any outline that particularly touched me, this is one memory that I kept. So, forgiveness is very important. And we must understand that we imprison ourselves when we don't forgive other people. And it comes with both spiritual and sometimes physical health issues can come as a result of our inability to forgive people and let go uh, of it. We cannot actually um, be restored when we harbor bitterness in our hearts. Then we talk about wholesome communication. Wholesome communication. Now you say that we have review is a very Interesting one. So, wholesome communication. Um, can somebody remind us? What do they say on that wholesome communication? I remember that we have a story. If you remember, it was prepared by a brother. A story of Dr. Paul yong Cho, a popular South Korean evangelist. And something was said there in that story. I don't want to recap because time is already a factor here. But what exactly? Can anybody remember who attended the study? What did we say about our speech? You remember, sir? Okay. Yeah, I remember when we treat that study. Why the outline, you know, the the outline is talking about when someone speaks a negative to his body, to himself, it's received from the body, and they never take it and bring out the negative results out of it. Mm. You're a good student, sir. I respect you. And he says, yes, so where he says, today we look at how we communicate to ourselves at home, at work, in the church, and in the society. So we try to look at that our communication should be wholesome. Wholesome means should be healthy. We should not, we should be careful not to throw negative words at people. Tell people how ugly they are. Tell people they are dullard. Tell people you cannot make it. All those very negative words have a way of sending a message when somebody takes it in. And the same thing in our communication to ourselves. In our homes, in the society, in church what we say to one another as a way of conveying far more bigger messages to ourselves. Okay, total complete obedience was uh, is perhaps the last of those studies that we'll look at. 
complete obedience. Vikasa, were you at this study? Okay, so I'll give you the honor of giving us a summary. Complete obedience, unwavering obedience to God's command. Yes. You are the preview. Uh, yes, I think Mrs. Odia took that study, and I think we'll still take that study by God's grace in, in second um, Next Sunday. Month. In I remember also stating that it has always been the culture to go to war and bring by spoil in Israel, but this assignment was different, different. and. Because of that, I think from the message that came through somewhere from God, God was really displeased. It was an assignment that ruined not just him, but shut the door of kingship to his descendants. So we're saying that as we walk with God, we should pray, all of us, um, child of God, servant of God, leader of God, whatever we are, that any assignment God has given us, we we'll pray that God demands from us complete obedience. Hallelujah. Okay, so we are basically taking a quick look at our study for the quarter. Is there any general question? Already over short our time. Maybe we'll take one or general comment. It doesn't have to be a question. Just general summary of the quarter. Have anybody ingredients of obedience is what we are looking at of restoration. Is there any general summary in one sentence? Can we take any from any of us as a roundup? Any? See? We are okay. Hallelujah. Okay, so let's bow our heads. Let's just bow our heads and I just allow us. Just um, maybe a few seconds, a minute. Just reflect on all we have tried to touch. Um, there are different teachings that we're taking, but we try to touch them in bits and pieces. You may not have the outline for those who are new, and for those who are here who may have missed out one of the week, and those who are even here who may not have the outline here. Can we just spend just a few moments to just reflect on the studies? that we've touched on. I don't know which particular one. I was honest to admit one at the study that I did not forget. As you reflect on it, can you just say a word of prayer on any or all of the studies as you can draw anything out and just pray and tell God? Is it in complete obedience that we just talked about how God gives instruction per time. It is customary to go to war and bring spoil. But on this occasion, God did not say bring any. He said destroy everything. Amending the act it was drawing our attention to the fact that they were in agreement on what they wanted to do. How much more when we are on a project with God? I'd like to invite the Reverend Canon Manager, please come and round us up in prayers as we conclude this first quarter. Our precious Father, we give you all glory and honor for your love over our lives. We thank you, Lord, for these Fridays that you have been, you have enabled us to learn at your feet. Lord, we ask and pray that all we have learned through these months and all these Fridays, you will enable us to implement in our lives as your own children, that our lives, O oh God, will show forth your praise even to others. That, Lord, 
when men see us, they will see of a truth that we are your children. Enable us, O Lord. These are more mercies we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Bless you. So there's one Bible study next week, as we know that Good Friday. So after that, the next quarter study will start. We'll start a series of studies again. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Um, let's not forget um, tomorrow. We start um, our program at seven. Um, the seven hours of prayer. And we start with the Holy Communion in the chapel. And there we go state by state with our prayers and praises. Please, let's take note. Also, for those in the brigade, I know that they are also going to Ikorodu in search of palms. We also remember them that God will wish them well. I also want them to know that the procession at 7 a.m. does not really involve them so they should all get set for 10 30 a.m they should all get set except the officers who come to seven normally so we don't keep the children for a long time and on sunday i pray 